Hi, everyone, and welcome to Murder and Merlot. We are a true crime book club podcast. I'm your host, Tara. And I'm your host, Michelle. Happy Easter, Michelle. Happy Easter, Tara. Hope you had a good weekend. It was beautiful this weekend. Yes, spring has sprung. Just, Hopefully it stays that way. No more blizzards like we had stays. recently. Oh my yeah. gosh, that blizzard on Monday was ridiculous. It was horrible. Um, yeah, Not so good. <laughs> hopefully everybody else had a great Easter and a great long weekend as well. Yes. We're going to keep our chit chat short and sweet this this episode because we have a long one ahead of us here I think the longest episode we've ever done. <laughs> and with good reason, let's yeah. be honest. Like there's yeah. some things you just can't cut out. So, so many things. I tried to go back and cut some stuff out and I'm like, nope, I just can't. It's all relevant. So yeah, I apologize for missing last week's posting, but I think you guys will, will understand why after we get through this episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a lot. So it's a lot. sit back. <laughs> Grab the bottle of wine and just, right. not just one glass. You're going to need the bottle. It's a big one. One glass will not do it for this episode. So no. get ready. Hold on to your butts. Absolutely. But first, we are going to talk about our favorite responses from last episode's fluff and stuff question, which was, what is a common misconception about where you live? And I love the answers that we got for this question. And it was also super fun to have Alex and Amy from Small Town Not Small Minds on our show to help us answer this question. So we hope that you checked out their show. Yeah, they were so fun. Mm -hmm. It was very cool to uh, record with another podcast. That was it's very interesting. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Very, very fun. Uh, my favorite response was from Angela on Facebook, a consistent fan and responder. And I just, I love that. So thank you, Angela. She said, whenever I say I live in a small town or in the country out east, I think people right away already think I'm a little strange. One time while traveling internationally, I told a couple I was from Canada, and right away, they assumed that I lived in an igloo in my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> I love Which, it. I've heard that as well. <laughs> Same. Yeah, or that we ride deer or elk to school, stuff like Drive that. Drive dog sleds. Dog sleds. Yeah, I've, I've heard a lot of good Canadian stuff like that. So love it. I think it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And Luke, another consistent fan and responder, yes, <laughs> sent us a message that said, I'm living on Vancouver Island, and I always thought it was just hippie land out here, but I've found a surprising amount of rednecks. That's not rednecks in a hateful way, of course. I mean, rednecks as in they like trucks and hunting like myself. Interesting. And I would never have known that me, there's me truck neither. and hunt, hunting loving people living on Vancouver Island. Same here. That's, that's very surprising, but I guess it's good to know. Yeah. And I thought the hippie answer was so yeah. fitting. Relevant for today. Like, so, so fitting. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, excellent. I think that's all we have for the top of the show. So we should probably yes. get going. Let's do it. So, all right, friends, grab your glass and get cozy. Let's talk about murder. Tink, tink. Well, here we are, part three of the Manson Family Murders. Today we are going to trial and it's going to get bonkers. Yes, I said bonkers. It seems appropriate. Totally. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> I have decided to do this in four parts. Hope that's cool with y'all. Next episode, however, is going to be a little bit different than the others. It will be a little bit more relaxed, and we will be chit-chatting about the aftermath of all of this, where people are now, and maybe we'll throw in some conspiracy theories in there too. So it's going to be a lot of fun, I think. Um, but for this episode, we will have a lot of information to cover, so we're just going to get yeah. going. <laughs> yes. Let's do it. We last left off meeting the family and asking the question, was Charles Manson truly responsible for the murders of 11 people, even if he wasn't present for them? And hopefully I will be able to answer that question for you today. Also towards the end of part two, we talked about Danny DiCarlo's interview. He gave a lot of names and a lot of information. So with this, detectives made two requests. One, would he show them around Spawn Ranch? And two, would he be willing to testify? Danny was like, uh, yeah, no, I don't feel like dying, so that's not going to happen. Uh, paraphrasing, of course. <laughs> <laughs> 
even if Charlie was put behind bars for life, there would still be a lot of family members left on the outside. He also had a son to worry about, and he knew they wouldn't think twice about carving him to pieces. And this conversation happened Mm -hmm. before he learned about Zero's suspicious death. After he was informed of Zero's suicide, he was even more certain he didn't want to testify. The detectives did, however, offer to have two previous charges against him be dropped and reminded him that there was also a reward of $25,000 for information about the murders. So eventually he did come around, but it was only under the condition that if he went back to Spawn's ranch, he would be handcuffed. That way, if there were still family members there, it would not look like he was a willing participant. So that's what they did. Accompanying him to the ranch included our main man, Vincent Bugliosi. On November 18, 1969, the deputy district attorney had been handed the job of prosecuting the Tate LaBianca killers. And of course, he went on to write the book Helter Skelter. A little bit more about the man, he was born in Minnesota, attended the University of Miami and received BA and BBA degrees. I think that's Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Business Administration degrees, I believe. (laughs) From there, he went to UCLA and graduated in 1964 with a Bachelor of Laws degree and joined the LA County District's attorney the same year. He tried close to a thousand cases, and in most, he obtained convictions. Obviously, he was good at what he did because it was only five years into his career when he was given one of the biggest murder cases in history to prosecute alone. Originally, Aaron Stovitz, who was the head of the trials division in the district attorney's office, was going to be the co-prosecutor, but he was pulled off the case only months later to tend to his other duties. This was obviously a huge undertaking, and for two years, Bugliosi worked an average of 100 hours a week on the case and even had to have bodyguards living in his home with his wife and two children as Manson had threatened to kill him. And something I found interesting while researching, Vincent Bugliosi and Charles Manson were the same age, both born in 1934, only months apart, yet they led, they led such different lives. Well, that is interesting. I didn't know that. Yes, they were both, uh, I believe, 35 years while this was all taking place. And- that, that so was like wild. My age. Yeah. Like I couldn't imagine prosecuting this case at my age. I feel like a child. <laughs> or on the flip side, you could have a hippie sex drug cult. Just saying. True. <laughs> Still, I'm not old enough. <laughs> <laughs> at what age do you become old enough to have that <laughs> responsibility? I don't know, but I feel like 35 is not it. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> If anybody knows the appropriate age, please let us know. (laughs) Anyways, we're getting ahead of ourselves here, so let's get back to Spawn Ranch. As I'm sure you could imagine, this place was quite the scene. The rundown movie set was littered with wrecked vehicles, and there weren't any signs of life, at least not right away. First, they sought out the owner, George Spawn, to receive permission to search the area. And this quote from Helter Skelter just really paints a picture. Quote, it was as if every fly in the area had taken shelter there during the storm. 81-year-old George Spawn was sitting in a decaying armchair, wearing a Stetson and dark sunglasses. In his lap was a chihuahua, at his feet a cocker spaniel. A hippie girl of about 18 was fixing his lunch, while a transistor radio tuned to a cowboy station blared Young Love by Sonny James. End quote. And I just feel like I can smell it through yeah the back, right like yeah totally <laughs> just dirty and maybe like mothballs <laughs> just dead flies that's, that's dust the, like dust that yeah dusty just, old house yeah, yeah decaying wood that's that's the vibe that I get I totally thought you were gonna say decaying old person but... <laughs> <laughs> well, that too <laughs> you know uh, poor George <laughs> George gave them permission to search any time, day or night, and as often as they needed to. Bugliosi made sure to get it on tape so none of the family members could threaten him later on, forcing him to say he never gave permission. Once they left his shack, people started appearing out of everywhere. They even found a toothless old lady in a doghouse. Although it was strange, they pressed on. Their main objective was to find 22 bullets or shell casings. Of course, there were none found at the actual crime scenes because the gun used was a revolver and therefore it wouldn't have rejected the casings after being fired, but this would still be important evidence 
if they were to find the gun used in the crime, which, reminder, it was already in police possession at this point, but we're not going to get into that again because you already know our feels about that whole situation. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Some strong feels. At the ranch, Danny was able to show detectives some of the favorite shooting areas used by the family. In one of them, they found 68, 22 bullets and 22 shells. Unfortunately, however, it was later determined that these bullets did not match the ones that were used for the murders. The next stop was the very remote Barker Ranch. It took three hours to get there, and along the way, Vincent learned more about the previous raid from the fellow officers. The first trip they had made out there, of course, was in regards to suspected auto theft and arson. When they arrived, they found multiple vehicles with wants on them. They tried to page for a backup, but couldn't due to the isolated mountain range. So they decided they would have to leave and come back with more men later on. The raid was on October 9th, and around 4 a.m., they found two men sleeping on the ground with a sawed-off shotgun. One of those men were Clem Tefts. They were both arrested, which was quite fortunate, as they had actually been out on the hunt for Kitty Lutzinger and Stephanie Schramm, who had fled from the ranch the previous day. Also another man named Soup Spoon. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one, (laughs) who was a lookout, was found sleeping on the ground as well, and was arrested. There was another lookout post that the officers almost missed, but suddenly a woman emerged, took a squat, peed just right out in the open, and then scampered away. You know, as you do. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So thanks to the girl that couldn't hold her bladder, the officers were able to locate and arrest Leslie Van Houten, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Gypsy. Inside the ranch house, there were more, including Susan Atkins, Squeaky Fromey, and Linda Baldwin. Sorry, the Squeaky Fromey just still throws me off. Does not sound right. I know. (laughs) In another ranch nearby, there were still more family members. Sandra Good, a.k.a. Sandy, Ruth Ann Morehouse, Mary Ann Schwarm, and Brenda McCann. And I'm sorry for, again, throwing a whole bunch of names at you. There are just so many damn people involved in this case. It's insane. So there were a total of 10 females and three males arrested in the first Barker raid. They also found two babies who were badly sunburned. Mm. And these were one-year-old Zizozo's Zadfrak Glutz. Of course, mother was Susan Atkins. And one-month-old Sunstone Hawk, whose mother was Sandra Good. Those poor kids. Oh, man. Going through life with those names. Right. They must have chosen something else because i mean at at least sunstone you could shorten to sunny yeah yeah sunny would be nice but but i don't i can't even say it (laughs) zizozos zizozos like what do you call zo zizo Zizo. yeah 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 Yeah, poor children (laughs) the rest of the search revealed many stolen vehicles mostly dune buggies a stolen ruger 22 single shot lots of knives, and a lot more sleeping bags than people. With this, they decided to go again another night and catch the rest off guard. On October 12th, they returned and arrested three women, one being Diane Lake and four men, the most notable ones being Bruce Davis and Zero, whose true name was John Philip Hot. I don't think I mentioned that in the last episode. And that had been just less than a month before his mysterious death. At first, there was no sign of their leader, Charles Manson, but the search continued. One officer decided to check the house again after the other arrests were made. It was completely dark now, so he only had a candle to light the way. Officer Purcell had lowered the light towards the hand basin and the small cupboard below. And I'm just getting so excited. (laughs) Look at my face. This is my favorite part of the story. I'm trying not to look... Uh, favorite part i'm trying not to look at my face because it's making me smile (laughs) i can't talk (laughs) anyways (laughs) he noticed that the cupboard was partially open and long hair was hanging out of the top it seemed impossible that a person could get into such a small space but soon a figure started to emerge the officers advised the tiny man not to make any false moves but he was just happy to get out of the cramped cupboard The space had only measured at three by one and a half by one and a half feet. Manson, leader of them all, was only five foot two and a very thin man. Oh, so tiny. (laughs) 
Oh, it's so tiny. The, so tiny. Like, it's just the best picture of him just like unfolding out of this cupboard. Right? Like, oh yeah, here I am. Oh, I need to stretch. <laughs> right? And every time I'm just like, how did you get in there in the first part and get the cover closed? Like, did you have somebody close it for you? Because otherwise, how would you do that? Right? Is Are there like a towel bar on the inside that's also maybe. restricting more space? Like... Maybe this was like a planned like hideout for him. Like I'm going to take the tiny cupboard and I'm going to have a little handle on the inside. But God damn it. I have long hippie hair <laughs> yeah. and it, it like blew it, my cover. <laughs> yeah. If it wasn't for the long hippie hair, like he probably wouldn't have been caught. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so funny. Oh my God. It's the best. It's my favorite. It is the best. Oh man. Charlie, who is dressed completely in buckskins was taken outside. Lined up with the others, it was very obvious that he had a lot nicer clothing than the rest of the family. Three more members were arrested after this as well, so it was a pretty good haul, although some of the suspects were obviously later released. And reminder, that was all from the previous searches at Barker Ranch. The search that was currently taking place with Bugliosi did not recover too much, but at least he could see firsthand how secluded of a location they had chosen to hide out in and for him to also get a glimpse into the family's living situation. Of those that had been released included Squeaky and Sandy. Bugliosi had noticed them walking near the courthouse one day and told them he'd like to talk to them. If they agreed, he would buy them candy, which sounds creepy, but it worked well on the Manson girls, and they agreed. He, of course, wouldn't get a lot of useful information from the girls, but he did find them quite interesting. They smiled the whole time, no matter what question was asked or what the topic was. Mostly, they talked about love. Love is love, and Charlie is love. Interviews with other family members would have eerily similar results, as they would show the same characteristics, give the same responses, and none of them seemed to have their own personality anymore. The next items on the to-do list for the Tate-LaBianca prosecution was to, one, put out a want for Charles Tex Montgomery, two, find out if anyone related to the victims, family, or friends knew of any Manson family members, three, find out if the glasses found at the Tate home belonged to a family member, four, interview Terry Melcher, the record producer who previously owned 10,050 Cielo Drive. As for Bobby Beausoleil, in regards to the murder of Gary Hinman, the trial was already underway, but on November 26, there was a hung jury, 8-4 to four for conviction. There would have to be a new trial, and originally it had been given to Bugliosi as well. But later, that had changed, which is good, because I mean, one man can only do so much. Right? Like, how did they expect him to do another case on top of that? I don't understand. I have no idea. They're just like, here, take the biggest case you've ever, you're ever going to handle and have some more. Yeah, exactly. This is fine. It's fine. You don't need sleep. The very little sleep that you get. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's overrated. Yeah. Some of the family members that were still in custody had been interviewed by Sergeant Gutierrez, which included Ruth Ann Morehouse and Diane Lake. At the time, neither were too helpful. Ruth lied about everything and Diane wouldn't speak. Although things would later change and Diane, at only 16 years old, would become one of the most important witnesses, especially when it came to the case of Leslie Van Houten. Now, we haven't talked about Leslie up until this point, but that is because no one had named her as one of the killers yet. So let's find out more about her. Leslie Van Houten, 20, was born in Los Angeles. Her parents divorced when she was 14 and she started using drugs at 15. When she became pregnant at 17, her mother forced her to have an abortion, even though the baby was already quite far along. She went on to join the family in the summer of 1968, just one year before the murders took place. Nicknames included Luella Alexandria, Leslie Marie Sangston, Linda Sue Owens, and Lulu. Just totally all the same. <laughs> right. Makes sense. <laughs> totally. And her story makes you think she was only with them for a year. How was she already that brainwashed? But really, Manson only got out of prison in March 1967. So it pretty much happened that fast for all of the followers. It just really shows how practiced Manson was at manipulating because it took him no time at all to establish complete control over all of these people. Totally. Leslie was next to be interviewed, and she too was incredibly difficult. She was acting like a little girl and avoiding questions. She didn't want to talk about the murders. When asked what she had heard about them, she said, I'm deaf. I hear nothing. 
She did like to talk about the family, however, saying, you couldn't meet a nicer group of people. She got quite the shock, however, when she was informed of Zero's death and that he was playing Russian roulette by himself. With her breaking character, the officer was able to get some more information out of her. She thought that four had gone to the Tate house, three were girls, and one's name was Linda. Linda was quite new to the family, so Leslie didn't know much more about her. Shortly after that, she decided she was done talking because, quote, if Zero was suddenly found playing Russian roulette, I could be found playing Russian roulette, end quote. Not suspicious at all. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, detectives were like, no, nah, it was definitely a suicide, but the family members were like, oh, shit. Yeah, suicide with all the bullets in the chamber, no just, prints on the gun, you know. Just fully yeah. loaded. <laughs> we're going to give this a try. Yeah. <laughs> I like my odds. (laughs) Detectives were also making progress with locating Tex. It helped when they found out his real surname was Watson, not Montgomery. They traced his old address back to McKinney, Texas. The sheriff there was Tom Montgomery. Coincidence? Not exactly. Tom was his second cousin and confirmed that Charles was living there again. After being informed about the situation, he went and picked up Tex right away. Another big discovery was that detectives were able to match a print found on the door of the Tate house to Charles Tex Watson. Later on, they would also match a print found on the French doors inside of Sharon Tate's bedroom, leading to the pool to Patricia Krenwinkel. So that was pretty significant. Very. Terry Melcher was brought in for questioning, and that played out very well for the prosecution. He unknowingly had information that was critical to the case. Melcher was friends with Dennis Wilson. One night, Dennis gave him a ride back to his place, 10,050 Cielo Drive, and Charles Manson tagged along. Although there was no evidence that Manson had gone inside the gate, this still indicates that he had previously been to the Tate residence. Wow. Mind-blowing. Yeah. (laughs) December 1st, 1969, it was announced at a press conference that the Tate and LaBianca cases had been solved. Warrants were issued for the arrests of Charles D. Watson, 24, who was in custody in Texas, Patricia Krenwinkel, 21, who was in custody in Alabama, and Linda Kasabian, age and whereabouts unknown. More were to be named later on, of course. Chief Davis, that made the announcement, gave all the credit to the LAPD for their tenacious investigation and didn't mention that the key information originally came from the LASO that connected it all. But that's not that surprising. Yep, because they all work together as a really big team, right? Yep, we're all a team. The media went wild with this new information. They were looking to talk to any family member that wasn't in custody. Of course, Sandy and Squeaky were always willing to spread the good word of Charles Manson to anyone that would listen, so they were all too happy to take these interviews. Barbara Hoyt was another family member that the LAPD was questioning as well. She admitted that she had overheard Charlie talking about the murder of Shorty Shea multiple times. One time she heard him tell DiCarlo that Shorty committed suicide, with a little help from us. Another time he described someone hitting Shorty over the head with a pipe, everyone stabbing him, Clem chopping off his head, and then they cut him into nine pieces. Brutal. Rough, man. So rough. She also heard Sadie telling Uish about the murders of Abigail Folger and Sharon Tate. Uish told Barbara there were 10 other murders that the group had committed. Although Barbara was scared, she was willing to cooperate, although this nearly got her killed. Bum, bum, bum. (laughs) Dun, dun, dun. We'll talk about that later. In regards to Susan Atkins, old crazy Sadie, it was decided that she would not be given immunity for testifying, which is... 100% fair, she obviously had way too big of a role in the murders to get off scot-free. She did get a pretty good deal still. If she testified truthfully before the grand jury, the prosecution could not seek the death penalty, nor could her testimony be used against her or her co-defendants during the trial. And to clarify, a grand jury helps determine whether charges should be brought against a suspect, while a trial jury renders a verdict at the criminal trial itself. So basically, all the prosecution is getting out of this is an indictment. Law, man, it's complicated. (laughs) Yeah, 
got to learn. I feel a like lot I have about... a law degree though, after reading 100%, this book. hundred <laughs> percent. I was just going to say that, like you learn a lot about the ins and outs of it all from this book. Cause whole oh, man, it's complicated. During Susan's grand jury testimony, she described life with the family, their garbage runs and their creepy crawls, garbage runs being dumpster diving for food behind grocery stores. Creepy crawls are well, creepy. Yes. Yeah. So creepy. <laughs> this is where a group of them would go out at night dressed in dark clothing, choose a house at random and just move around it silently. Ugh, I hate it. I know. And sometimes <laughs> they would just move things around the home to mess with the people when they woke up. Oh yeah. And then they also always carry knives on them because you know, that's important. <laughs> Sounds a bit like a totally. rehearsal to me. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> hate I, it. <laughs> me too. It, the thought, the thought, I can't even think about that. Like, you know, that's no. one of my biggest fears is like home invasions. It's I do. Just to think about like people creepy crawling around your house while you sleep. Like, ooh, disgusting. Yeah. Not okay. And like, what would happen if you woke up? That's why they had knives. You'd probably be dead. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Horrifying. That is a horror movie right there. Goddamn. Mm -hmm. After that, of course, she told the story once again about the Tate murders. Each time the story was told, more interesting details seemed to come to light. This time, she mentioned that while driving, Tex told them they would be hitting Terry Melcher's old house because Tex knew the layout. He also said that the objective was to get all of their money and to kill whoever was inside. When describing the murder of Stephen Parent, she was shown a photograph of the victim in his car. She responded, that is the thing I saw in the car. The jurors gasped and Vincent asked, when you say thing, you're referring to a human being? Yes, human being, she says, as if she's some type of goddamn alien. Ugh. What planet are you on, crazy Sadie? Man, she's the worst. <laughs> is the worst. Seriously, my least favorite. I mean, they're all pretty bad. I had to rate the Manson family girl. She is at the bottom for me. <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> we should do that one day. Anyways. <laughs> Once they made it inside, Frykowski was woken up with a gun in his face and said, who are you and what are you doing here? Tex replied, I am the devil and I'm here to do the devil's business. What took place inside the home was pretty well the same as what she had told Virginia and Ronnie, although there were a few differences. Abigail had actually been reading in her bedroom, not the living room, and she had smiled when she saw Susan. She likely assumed that it was one of Sharon's friends, since there was always people coming and going from the Cielo residence. And I only mention that detail because for some reason it has always stood out to me from the book Helter Skelter. Totally. Me too. Just that image of her just like looking up and like smiling like, oh, hey, like I'm a nice person. And then to, yeah, to have to what be. happened to her. Not exactly. okay. It's, it's horrifying. Mm -hmm. She also described the struggle she had with Frykowski, where he pulled her hair and she was blindly stabbing. She claimed that she did not know what she was hitting. Maybe it was a human, maybe it was a chair. She wasn't sure because she had never stabbed a human before, and therefore she didn't know what it felt like. This did not line up with previous stories she had given, as she had admitted during other interviews to stabbing Hinman and to stabbing Frykowski in the legs three or four times. So she knew exactly what it felt like. Mm -hmm. She also said that even though Tex had told her to kill Sharon, she couldn't. So Tex stabbed her once in the heart. However, we know from the autopsy report that Sharon had been stabbed 16 times and Susan had told Virginia, I just kept stabbing her until she stopped screaming. After Sharon had been stabbed, Tex instructed her to write something that will shock the world. So Susan grabbed a towel, dipped it in Sharon's blood, wrote pig, and tossed the towel to the side. It had landed on Jay Sebring's face, which explained the so-called hood over his head. Once they got back to Spawn Ranch, they told Charlie how it all went down. Tex saying, boy, it sure was helter-skelter. Apparently Manson had thought it was all too messy though, so the next night he rounded the troops again, but this time he was going to show them how it was done. In addition to Tex, Sadie, Katie, and Linda were Manson, Clem, and Leslie. The plan was for them to hit two different houses and Charlie was going to pick them out. The first place they stopped, he noticed pictures of children through the windows, so he decided not to do that house. Although at some point, they may have to kill children as well, he explained. 
the next place they stopped looked familiar. They had been to this house, occupied by a herald, for an LSD party. Instead of targeting that house, however, he started walking up the driveway to the neighbor's house and went inside. When he returned, he called for Tex, Katie, and Leslie to go inside. The people were already tied up and to paint a picture more gruesome than anybody had ever seen. The three were also instructed to hitchhike back to the ranch, and the rest of the group continued on. Charlie had brought back a woman's wallet with him, and then he drove to a predominantly colored area to get rid of it. They stopped at a gas station, and Linda was told to leave it inside the bathroom so someone would find it, use the credit cards, and get pinned for the murder. Although Susan wasn't present for the LaBianca murders, she did hear about them from Patricia Krenwinkel, otherwise known as Katie, in case you get that mixed up like we do. <laughs> mm-hmm. She said, Tex took care of the man in the living room, and the girls took Rosemary to the bedroom. Rosemary fought extremely hard for her life and her husband's, all the way up until her death. It was apparently Katie that stabbed a fork into Lino's stomach and carved war into his flesh. The three killers then took a shower in the home and then made themselves something to eat, since, you know, they worked up an appetite. Why is this a thing? Why are people always, like, eating in crime scenes? It does happen frequently, doesn't it? I know, like, we just talked about it on the morning news last week, like, not last week, two weeks ago. Yeah, true. (laughs) So strange. Crime makes you hungry, apparently. Apparently. Pack some snacks. (laughs) (laughs) The last thing from Susan's testimony that I will mention is the family's definitions of the words pig and helter-skelter. She admitted that these words were used quite frequently by Charlie. Pig was a word to use to describe the establishment. But, <laughs> but you must understand that all words have no meaning to us and that helter-skelter was explained to me. That makes total sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> She was asked who explained that to her, and she said, quote, Charlie, I don't even like to say Charlie. I'd like to say the words came from his mouth, that Helter Skelter was to be the last war on the face of the earth. It would be all the wars that have ever been fought built on top of the other, something no man could conceive in his imagination. You can't conceive of what it would be like to see every man judge himself and then take it out on every other man all over the face of the earth, end quote. <laughs> just makes so much sense it's just exhausting being in their brains yeah. Bobby, honestly it, it honestly hurts yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> following this and four other witnesses to the grand jury these indictments were given leslie van houten two counts of murder and one count of conspiracy to commit murder charles manson charles watson patricia krenwinkel susan adkins and linda kasabian seven counts of murder, and one count of conspiracy to commit murder. It wasn't too long after that. Rosemary LaBianca's wallet was found in a gas station bathroom. However, it had been placed inside the toilet tank, and this is why it hadn't been discovered sooner. This evidence supported Susan's story. On December 11th, Manson was brought in before Judge William Keene, wearing his spiffy buckskin outfit as usual. Keene appointed public defender Paul Fitzgerald to represent Manson. On December 16th, Susan Atkins was brought in before Judge Keene and pleaded not guilty to all eight counts of the indictment. The judge set the trial for February 9th, 1970, but it would continually be pushed back. Linda Kasabian, who had turned herself in, was also eventually arraigned and pleaded not guilty as well. Once details of Susan's story started to leak to the press, this got Bernard Weiss thinking about the gun his son, Stephen, had found back in September. He knew it just had to be the gun used in the Tate murders. He phoned the Valley Service Division of the LAPD that had retrieved the gun to inform them. The detective was like, yeah, yeah, we'll look into that, but they never called him back. So then he called the LAPD homicide. They told him they don't keep guns for that long, and they had probably already (laughs) thrown it into the ocean. After an argument with this officer, they hung up on each other. Then Bernard picked up the phone once again, but instead of calling anyone in law enforcement, he called his neighbor, a newscaster for Channel 2. The newscaster then called someone from the LAPD, and eventually, the 22 was turned over to the Tate detectives. Now they just needed to link the gun to Charles Manson, which Danny DiCarlo should be able to do while testifying. Isn't that frustrating? (laughs) That gun, man. What is it about that gun? There's something about it. But for, 
an LAPD officer to be like, yeah, we probably already threw that in the ocean. Like, don't even bother being like, oh, I'll look into it. I'll, you know, give the office a quick call and we'll check first. No, he's just straight up. Eh, we threw that in the ocean. Like, you don't know and that. Like, and I'm sorry, if that's how you're disposing of fucking guns, I think you need to be doing something different. I know. Yeah, I was very curious about that. I'm like, how long do they actually have to hold, like, say, a gun that they're found? Like, I feel like there should be a specific amount of time that they need to hold it. And then a specific way to Disposed. get rid of said gun. Said gun right? Absolutely. <laughs> Mind-blowing. Like, yeah, I have too many questions. <laughs> God damn it, LAPD. Why do you do this to us? <laughs> Oh yeah, and quick correction about Danny DiCarlo. In the last episode, a few times I kept calling the biker gang the straight Satanists rather than the straight Satans, and I don't know why it kept coming out of my mouth like that, but it did, so my bad. Whoops. I think I say Satanist more than the word Satan. I don't I don't know why that comes up more often, but... Well, it's weird because Satans has an S on it, right? I, yeah. <laughs> sure. Most Satanists... Yeah. You know, it makes sense to me why you okay. messed it up. It's all good. Sounds good. I was just listening back to it. And I'm like, why Why do I do the things that I do? <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. On December 17th, Manson appeared before Judge Keene again, this time requesting the dismissal of his public defender as he wanted to represent himself. Classic. The judge was not convinced that this would be a good idea or that he was competent to do so, but he said he would consider it. The Manson girls also started requesting their public defenders to be dismissed as well. It was clear that Charlie was getting messages to them and that the end goal was for him to run the entire defense himself. Eventually, Manson was allowed to be his own lawyer, but fortunately, that didn't last very long. Thank goodness. No kidding. While Charlie was trying desperately to control the family from behind bars, his hold started to slip on Diane Lake. When previously interviewed, she refused to talk, but now she started to open up. She recalled that a week or two before the August 16th raid, Leslie had returned to Spawn Ranch with a purse, some rope, and a bag of coins. Leslie then burned the purse. That night, there had also been someone knocking on the door looking for Leslie. She explained that the man had given her a ride back from Griffith Park, and she didn't want to talk to him. Griffith Park happens to border Los Feliz, where the LaBiancas lived. The coins were interesting to detectives, as they knew Lino had a coin collection. Weeks later, Leslie told Diane more about that night. The murders she was involved with did happen near Griffith Park. There was a boat in the driveway. She had stabbed someone that was already dead. They had written on the door in the refrigerator with blood, and that she had wiped down the place so there would be no prints. Prior to this, the only evidence that linked Leslie to the LaBianca murders was the testimony given by Susan Atkins, but of course, they couldn't use that without independent cooperation. Diane was the key. However, there was some concerns as she was emotionally disturbed and had occasional LSD flashbacks. It wasn't clear if she would be able to testify, and she had been sent to Patton State Hospital for treatment. Fortunately, before the trial took place, Staff psychologists determined her problems were emotional, not mental, and she would be fit to testify at trial. At this point, Charlie and the girls were feeling pretty confident that there was no case against them. Leslie wrote to her parents that even if she was convicted, she would, <laughs> she would be out in seven years. And to that, I just have to laugh, because if you listen to our morning news episodes, you'll know why. I literally just smiled because I was like, yeah, that didn't work out for you, Leslie. <laughs> Nope, not quite. We're what, like 50 years later? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One of the most important aspects that the prosecution had to establish was Manson's control over the family. Without a significant amount of evidence to support this, it would seem very unlikely that one man could convince a group of followers to kill multiple people at random without hesitation. Although Charlie did dominate the family, he would often give suggestions rather than commands, so this wasn't the easiest task. Of course, any time a suggestion was given, it wasn't actually optional, but he made others feel as though they were choosing to do the task rather than being forced to. Diane often explains in her book that the girls needed to learn what Charlie wanted done without him saying anything. If she read his needs wrong, she would get struck, so it was important that they learned fast. Manson's co-defendants helped make it very clear that he had all of the control over them. For example, when Leslie's attorney requested a court-appointed 
psychiatrist examine his client, Charlie didn't like that, and once again got the word to Leslie to request her attorney be replaced. Her attorney opposed this and said, quote, this girl will do anything that Charles Manson or any member of the so-called Manson family says. This girl has no will left of her own. Because of this hold that Charles Manson and the family has over her, she doesn't care whether she is tried together and gets the gas chamber. She just wants to be with the family, end quote. Pretty significant for the defending attorney to say. Yeah, it's not looking good for her. <laughs> no. Other examples of Charlie's control prior to the murders taking place included orchestrating orgies, deciding who would go together and what they would do, giving out LSD to the group, deciding how much each person would get and giving himself less so he could still be in control. And he always placed himself above others, literally. When they ate meals or he gave his sermons, he would be sitting on top of a large rock while the rest of the family sat in a circle around him. Charlie's sermons, teachings, bullshit, whatever you want to call it, always included quotes from the Bible and the Beatles. He believed that the Beatles were speaking to him through the music, especially in the White Album, about what was going to go down. What was coming down was Helter Skelter, of course. And I know I've mentioned the idea of Helter Skelter multiple times, but I want to explain the whole concept here. It's not just a war to end all wars, it was specifically a race war. Charles believed that the Black community was going to revolt and kill all the white people. There would be mass hysteria, and the cops in the establishment wouldn't know what to do, and the Black man would take over. Meanwhile, the Chosen family will be hiding out in a bottomless pit in Death Valley. Inside this cave is a golden city where there is a river of milk and honey and fruit trees with 12 different types of fruit. It is always light down there, and it is not too hot and not too cold. Then they would grow the family to reach 144,000 people. By that time, the black man would have figured out that since they had never been in control before, they wouldn't know what they were doing, and that is when Charlie and the family would emerge out of the desert and take control. <sighs> Very specific. Again, it is exhausting to understand how these people think. <laughs> the family even made a mural of Helter Skelter, at Spawn Ranch, which is obviously significant for the prosecution to further link this idea to the group. What the song Helter Skelter actually refers to is a fairground attraction in the UK that looks like a lighthouse, but has a slide that winds around it. But yeah, race war, same thing. <laughs> Absolutely sense. the same. Yes. I can totally see the connection there. On January 16th, Manson, the shit disturber that he was, appeared before Judge Dell and filed a habeas corpus motion. This motion claimed that the sheriff was depriving Manson Christ, that is what he called himself in prison was Manson Christ, of his spiritual, mental, and physical liberty in an unconstitutional manner, not in harmony with man's or God's law, and he asked that he be released. So basically, Charlie decided he didn't like his living conditions, and that should be enough for him to just be let out. Like, yeah, my bed's not very comfy, and I'm not allowed to run a hippie drug sex cult in here, so I think I'm going to bounce. Like, if it was that easy. Right. Like, what would be I, the I point just, of any of this? <laughs> I just really don't like prison, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm out. I appreciate that you guys gave me a bed and some food, but I just really don't like the vibes in here. So I, mean, I really I... prefer to live in the dirty, dirty <laughs> desert that I was living in before. Yes. So bye. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> okay, Charlie. You do you, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you do you. <laughs> I probably don't have to say this, but that request was denied. He then went on to complain he wasn't allowed to interview his co-defendants or other family members such as Bobby Beausoleil. Oh, no, shit. I wonder why. <laughs> I, I cannot see how that would go wrong in any way. No, these people that are under your control, we'll just let you talk to them. It's fine. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <sighs> the audacity. Charlie. <laughs> oh, man. It's comical how, like, his thoughts is just like, how do you think this is logical at all? And that you're going to get away with it. Like, you're going to yeah. be like, yeah, I'm, I'm out. And the yeah. judge is going to say, yeah, sure. Okay. I agree with you. Your living conditions suck. Yeah. See ya. Have a nice day. 
Oh boy. <laughs> Along with establishing Manson's control, the prosecution also had to make the motive helter skelter believable, which would not be the easiest task as it was far from conventional. But bit by bit, Vincent collected statements and witnesses that would support this theory. They also discovered another partial motive, and that was to instill fear into Terry Melcher as the family believed he had made promises to Charlie that he did not keep. And I never thought that Charlie's music had that significant of a role in all of this until I listened to Diane Lake's audiobook. But after being turned away by Terry Melcher, Charlie really started to change and became a much darker person. It shouldn't have been surprising that his music wouldn't be accepted by the mainstream, but of course, to Charlie and the family, it was shocking. I had read that. I can't remember where I read it, but I had had read it before that it, when he got turned down, that he got mm -hmm. crazy and dark. Right. And Manson's music was quite interesting. My favorite interpretation comes from a folk song expert that later listened to Charlie's tapes. His notes say, Quote, somewhere along the line, Manson has picked up a pretty good guitar beat. Nothing original about his music. But the lyrics are something else. They contain an amazing amount of hostility. You'll get yours yet, etc. This is rare in folk songs, except in old murder ballads. But even there, it is always past tense. In Manson's lyrics, these are things that are going to happen. Very spooky. Overall judgment, a moderately talented amateur. End quote. I like that. Very spooky. <laughs> Very spooky. <laughs> After interviewing Terry Melcher for a second time, they discovered that Rudy Altobelli, the owner of 10,050 Seattle Drive, had confided in him that in March 1969, Manson had been on the property again, but this time he made it inside the gate. He apparently had gone to the guest house looking for Terry, but he had moved out months ago, and Rudy had to ask Charlie to leave. Of course, this put Rudy next in line to be interviewed, and he revealed even more about this encounter. Manson had originally stopped at the main house, but the tenants had sent him to the guest house to speak to Rudy. Who was inside the main house that day? Sharon, Gibby, Wojciech, and Jay. That means four out of the five Tate victims had seen the man that would later order their deaths. That's huge. <sighs> Crazy. Huge. Absolutely. But as much as I would love to talk about all these crazy connections and Charlie's insane ideas, I really have to move on to the trial, which was now set for March 30th. I just want to make one quick note. Sure. Um, I found it really interesting in the book because Vincent Bugliosi says it's not his job as a prosecutor to prove motive, but he was doing his very best to prove that motive so that his job as prosecutor was... I'm not wording this very well. Um, his job is to prove beyond a reasonable doubt, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So he doesn't actually have to prove motive, but the motive is just a really good, helpful part of proving reasonable doubt. So yeah, absolutely. And he also yeah. said that his job isn't going out and investigating necessarily, but to him, that's important. And he did do a lot of the investigative work himself. So that was mm -hmm. very interesting as well. Yeah, and I think it, that trial would have gone a lot differently if, had he not dug into the motive of Helter Skelter. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. The joint trial included Charles Manson, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Leslie Van Houten. You may be thinking that there were a couple people missing here, and you would be correct. Charles Tex Watson was still in Texas. In fact, he and his lawyer fought the extradition to California for nine months, and even after that, he didn't go to trial for quite some time. The other missing member was Linda Kasabian, even though she had been in custody in California. The reason for this, Susan decided that under no circumstance would she testify at the trial. So now the prosecution needed a new star witness. This is where Linda came in, and it worked out for the best. She did a great job. In fact, she was given immunity. And I think she deserved that immunity. Yes, absolutely. I think. As we will see, she did a great job and she was a much better witness than Susan Atkins would ever be. Yeah, 100 times over. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Linda had only been at Spawn Ranch for about a month before the murders took place. And although she was under Charlie's spell to some degree, she was not a murderer. She was a driver. 
Linda had been the only family member with a valid driver's license, except for Mary Brunner, but Mary had just been arrested, so Linda was chosen as the only other substitute. That night, Linda witnessed the shooting of Stephen Parent, Patricia chasing Abigail across the lawn with a knife, and Tex stabbing Frykowski to death. Linda's story was quite similar to one that Sadie told regarding Charlie giving the orders and driving to and from the scenes. However, there was a pretty notable detail that Sadie had left out. Charlie had attempted to commit three other murders on the night of the LaBianca attack. The plan, like I said previously, was to divide the group into two, and each group would take a separate house. Once they had set out on this mission, Manson had gotten out a few times to check potential houses, but they were not quite right. Next, they stopped at a church because Charlie wanted to get a minister or a priest, but the doors were locked. The next attempt was while driving. Linda was instructed to pull up next to a white sports car so Charlie could kill the driver. But just as he got out of the car, the light turned green and the car drove away. After that, the directions got very specific. They headed to Waverly Drive in Los Feliz. Linda had also been to the hippie hangout house, but Charlie said they would be hitting the neighbor's house instead. Her story about the LaBianca's home was essentially the same as Sadie's, but the drive home, again, had some differences. There was still one more attempted murder to take place. First, they pulled over at a service station, which was where Linda had been instructed to leave the wallet. She was then told to drive to the apartment that belonged to an actor she had recently met in Venice since he was a piggy. Upon arriving, Linda, Sadie, and Clem were instructed to knock on his door, get him to let them in. Linda was to slit his throat and Clem was to shoot him. Linda obviously was not okay with this and was not capable of murder. So instead, she purposely knocked on the wrong door and when someone answered, she apologized for having the wrong apartment. Charlie had already left, so they had to hitchhike home. But before they left, Sadie took a shit on the apartment landing because she is a real classy lady. She's the classiest, like... Literally an animal. (laughs) Seriously, I think she is mostly animal. I can't, I go back and forth between alien and animal. I don't know. It's just, it's a terrible thing, whatever it is. Like, anytime you're publicly defecating, (laughs) that, like... You're a bad person. You're a bad person. I don't like unless (laughs) Unless... It's an emergency and you try to find a bush. That's all I'm going to say. I mean, (laughs) there are those times. (laughs) I don't think this was one of those times. I I just don't. I don't think so. (laughs) Oh my God. (laughs) In the end, it was clear that Linda undoubtedly avoided another Manson murder. And since she did not partake in any of the killings, she would look a lot better on the stand than Crazy Sadie. The only concern was that when Linda had escaped from Spawn Ranch in August, she had left her baby behind. Although she knew that the baby would be safe, it would be difficult for others to understand how someone could leave their child with a group of killers. On March 6th, (laughs) I mean, it's, it's, it's fair. It's fair. Yeah. On March 6th, Manson appeared in court again to argue a number of motions. He also requested that he be free to travel any place he should deem fit in preparation of his defense. After this and a few outbursts towards the court, Judge Keene decided it was abundantly clear that he was not capable of acting as his own attorney and he would no longer be allowed to do so. Of course, more family members joined in on yelling at the judge and they were each sentenced to five days in county jail. When Sandy was being searched, it was discovered that she had brought a buck knife into the courtroom with her. So after this, the court started beefing up their security when it came to their visitors. Really? I feel like everybody should be searched before you go into a courtroom. I feel like that's a standard now because of people like this and and the Manson family. Probably. (laughs) Yeah. Charlie eventually settled on defense attorney Ronald Hughes even though he had never tried a case before. Shortly after that, however, Hughes asked Irving Kennerick to enter the case as Manson's lawyer, and Hughes would take on Leslie Van Houten's case. Kennerick was some type of legend in the Los Angeles courts, but not in a good way. He was known for his extreme and ridiculous obstructionist tactics. An example being a simple theft case, amount stolen around $100, was drawn out for three months and cost taxpayers $130,212. Like, ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Like, that is criminal, in my Mm -hmm. opinion. Totally. Yeah. 
Bugliosi was, of course, not thrilled with this news. The last thing they needed in this bizarre and difficult case was this clown to complicate things further. We already had Charlie for that. <laughs> and speaking of which, Manson was able to get Judge Keene removed from the case, and he was replaced with Judge Charles H. Older. The trial date was again pushed back, this time to June 15th. Every step along the way, Manson and the girls had to make some type of scene while in court. Manson would turn his chair around so his back would be facing the judge, or once when he didn't think the court was being fair, he pretended to be dead on a cross. The girls copied the crucifixion pose, and a scuffle broke out between Manson and a deputy. But that was only the beginning of yeah, the ridiculous it's just the start. <laughs> it's just a tiny little tidbit. Things were finally starting to progress, and the trial was soon to begin. The jurors had been selected, and Manson was already fed up with the defense attorneys making fools of themselves. In fact, when the trial began on July 24, 1970, Charles Manson showed up with a bloody X carved into his forehead and delivered this speech. Quote, I have X'd myself from your world. You have created a monster. I am not of you, from you, nor do I condone your unjust attitude towards things animals, and people that you do not try to understand. I stand opposed to what you do and what you have done in the past. You make fun of God and have murdered the world in the name of Jesus Christ. My faith in me is stronger than all of your armies, governments, gas chambers, or anything you may want to do to me. I know what I have done. Your courtroom is man's game. Love is my judge. End quote. Yowza. Yeah. <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> nice try, Charlie. After that, the real opening statement was presented by Vincent Pugliosi, which focused on Manson being the mastermind behind it all, as it would be the most important task. He was confident that the evidence against the other defendants would show that they were willing participants and murderers. During the opening statement, Kenrick objected nine times and asked for the whole statement to be stricken, Otherwise, a mistrial should be declared. Obviously, that didn't happen, and the trial continued. Oh, man, he's exhausting. I can't even with this guy. Yeah. Like, even Charlie is, like, fed up with him, and the trial hasn't even, like, hardly begun. So you know it's bad. Because this is yeah. Charlie's game. Yeah. He's doing exactly what Charlie does, and even Charlie's like, Jesus Christ, dude, this is too much. Like <laughs> Go away. Be yes. quiet. <laughs> Just sit down and let the man talk. Please, please stop. <laughs> the first day, witnesses included Sharon Tate's father, Colonel Paul Tate, Stephen Parent's father, Wilfred Parent, the housekeeper, Winifred Chapman, and a few other workers that had been recently on the Tate property. The following trial day, the three other defendants, Susan, Patricia, and Leslie, showed up with X's on their foreheads as well. They had lit matches, heated bobby pins red hot, burned their skin, and then opened up the burnt flesh with needles to make the scars more prominent. Mm. I know, it hurts. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't take long for the rest of the family members to follow suit on the outside as well, even making it a ritual where they would taste the blood running down their faces. This only helped the prosecution prove how much control Manson had over his followers. Oh man, it just, it hurts to even think about. I know. I did go and specifically look at the girls' foreheads and like their pictures of them like now. Yeah. And one of them has her hair styled so you can't see it. Mm -hmm. One of them you can see a really faint X and the other one she has prominent wrinkles in her forehead so you can't actually see the X anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, it's been like 50 years. So like, I know. Like that's yeah, they're still there. That's pretty impressive. Oh man, it just oh it hurts. <laughs> oh, totally. That day, Linda had been called to testify. On her way to the courtroom, Sandra Good yelled, you'll kill us all, you'll kill us all, but it didn't deter her. She was able to establish what the family was like, Charlie's domination over the group, and what happened the night of the Tate LaBianca murders. In just the first three days of her testimony, Kenrick objected 200 times. After that, people stopped counting. Linda was on the stand for 17 days, which is longer than most trials. A poor girl, man. Uh, exhausting. She's like, dude, just let me talk. Just <laughs> let me tell my story. Jesus. On August 3rd, 1970, 
On the front of every newspaper was President Nixon's statement declaring Manson guilty. He had failed to use the crucial word, allegedly, so this created a lot of issues. Manson was, of course, stoked. He got the attention of the President of the United States. He finally made it. And he was going to use this in court. One day, Manson suddenly stood up and turned towards the jury box, holding up a newspaper that read, Manson guilty, Nixon declares. Obviously, the jurors cannot have any outside influence, so this was a huge deal. How did Manson get the newspaper into the courtroom in the first place? Well, apparently, Dae Shin, Susan's lawyer, had brought it in to look at the sports section. He had no idea about the front page article. Right. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Shin was declared in direct content of the court and had to spend three nights in the county jail. And this wouldn't be the first or last time that one of the attorneys were either sent to the county jail or fined. It seemed to have happened rather frequently throughout this trial. Yeah. And the whole jury was sequestered, right? And when Mm -hmm. um, Nixon's statement came out, they had done everything they could to block windows. They didn't let them watch TV that day. Like, so it was a big shock to the jury when they actually saw that. So exactly. Juan Flynn, a ranch hand at Spawn, came in to talk to Bugliosi about testifying. He was reluctant at first, but the family had been tormenting him with threats, hang-up calls, racing around his trailer at night, oinking, and calling him a pig. So he had had enough. Also, Shorty Shea was his best friend, so that was a good enough reason to testify all on its own, and he would later take the stand. Manson had wanted Flynn to join the family, and he even admitted to him that he was responsible for the murders. When Flynn wouldn't bite, Manson grabbed his hair and yanked his head back, holding a knife to his throat, saying, are you going to come with me or do I have to kill you? Flynn was basically like, dude, I'm eating. Leave me alone. (laughs) If I want to contract a nine-month case of syphilis or gonorrhea, I'll let you know. Which is the best comeback I have ever heard. (laughs) Yeah. Many, many claps to you. (laughs) Tiny clap, tiny clap, like the balls, like he's literally got a knife to his throat and he's just like, I'm eating. <laughs> Leave me alone. Oh, don't scrub my lunch, man. <laughs> Amazing. I love it. After one, there was a slew of other witnesses. John Schwartz, the owner of the car Manson had borrowed the night of the murders without permission. Jim Ason, who had called the police the morning that the Tate victims were found. The first LAPD officers on the scene and the list goes on. As for the LaBianca case, witnesses included Frank Struthers, Rosemary's son, John Focianos, who was the last to see the LaBiancas alive, and a few others. Joe Granado from SID would eventually take the stand as well, but not for very long as he forgot his notes. He went on to admit that he didn't take samples from many of the blood spots, as he just assumed their origin. Thanks, Joe. That was super helpful. Way to do your job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Oh, yeah. By the way, after this, he went on to work for the FBI. So yeah, I hope he got better. I just hope he got better. That's concerning. (laughs) (laughs) Deputy medical examiner David Katsuyama was also brought in, and he too wasn't very helpful. While performing the Labiaka autopsies, he determined that the weapon used to inflict all of the stab wounds was a bread knife. A bread knife. Have you seen a bread knife? (laughs) It is not the most efficient stabbing tool. Just saying. Also, he didn't have any good evidence to support this because he failed to measure the victim's wounds. However, it was discovered that the original coroner probed some of the wounds and they had been deeper than the bread knife was long. Even the thickness and the width of the blade did not match at all. So also very helpful evidence. Thank you. Yes. Way to do your job. Right. (laughs) (laughs) He did, however, establish that Rosemary had many postmortem wounds, which was important in Leslie's case, who admitted she had stabbed someone after they died. So he did do one thing. Yes. So he did half his job. (laughs) Right. (laughs) (laughs) There were so many others that testified. I really can't get into it all, but other significant witnesses included Diane Lake, Rudy Altabelli, Terry Melcher, Danny DiCarlo, and Barbara Hoyt. As for Barbara, it was lucky she was able to make it to the witness stand at all. Fellow family members, Gypsy, Squeaky, Clem, and Awish, had taken her on a trip to Hawaii where they would try to convince her not to testify. 
If this plan failed, however, they were going to kill her. Before returning to California, Barbara was fed a hamburger that contained 10 hits of LSD. She was hospitalized, but she survived. Now she was more willing to testify than ever. She did a great job on the stand and supported Linda's story and provided compelling evidence about Manson's involvement. Crazy. I know. Poor girl. Just one of the many, like, attempted murders or other murders that happened during this trial, but I will talk about more of those in the next part. (laughs) Yes. Manson and the family continued to cause disruptions throughout the entire trial. Charles was angry with his defense attorney and did not want to be judged by what Kenrick said or did. The followers that were on the outside, when they weren't attempting other murders, held vigils outside the courthouse. They had to remain outside because of their constant interruptions during the trial, so they decided they would set up camp and wait for their brothers and sisters to be set free. Waiting for a long time, just saying. Yeah. Spoiler. They slept in the bushes, had X's in their foreheads, and wore sheath hunting knives, so it was quite the sight. Yeah. Sandy and two males once even approached Vincent Bugliosi after he left the courthouse. He told her that he was disappointed by what she had done to Barbara. Sandy's response was to start playing with her buck knife. Vincent walked away, but they followed. Eventually, he had to turn around and confront them, telling the men if they followed him one more time, he would deck them on the spot, which I love. (laughs) Yes. He's not taking their shit. I love it. No, which you can't or else... I think you would be dead. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Not long after this, Charlie told one of the bailiffs, quote, I'm going to have Bugliosi and the judge killed. Judge Older had already been under protection at this point, but now Bugliosi was assigned a bodyguard for the rest of the trial. One of the most memorable outbursts that happened during the trial was when Charlie was arguing with the judge once again about how he was using the courtroom to kill him. The court advised him, if you don't stop, I will have to have you removed. Manser replied, I will have to have you removed if you don't stop. I have a little system of my own. So sassy, by the way. Right? With this, he clutched his pencil in his right hand and suddenly leaped over the counsel's table towards the judge. The bailiff acted fast and leaped onto Manson's back, and then two other deputies joined. He was pinned and then was taken away to lock up, during which he yelled, In the name of Christian justice, someone should cut your head off. So that looks real good on you, Charlie. Keeping it classy there, Mr. Manson. Totally showing your innocence here. And it was like a 10 foot jump. It was insane. Like he's got some spring because he doesn't have the length in his body, but he's got the spring. And didn't the bailiff try to recreate it after court that day? I'm sure I, the bailiff did. And he was like, I've oh, heard I that. couldn't yes. do it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think a lot of humans could. Like, he's just springy, <laughs> apparently. Yeah. How terrifying. I know. Like, you think you should be safe, like, as a judge sitting up there and then a fucking wild haired crazy man tries to stab you with a pencil. And then after that, it was rumored that Judge Older just carried some heat with him. Yeah. When he came to court. <laughs> well, I would have. <laughs> There's a no pistol question. under those robes. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of room to carry under yeah. those robes. <laughs> uh, the other defendants had to be removed as well as they all stood up and started chanting something in Latin. Good times. So freaking weird, man. So weird. But I think Vincent said in the book that he was just like, honestly, at this point, that didn't even surprise me. That just was yeah. like, oh, okay, that's happening now. Like, Crazy shit just happens so often. They just got numb to it all. (laughs) Imagine just being on that jury, though. You're like, what's going to happen today? Right? (laughs) It's always interesting. Unless Kenrick decides that nobody's allowed to talk. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. Then it's real boring. Finally, 22 weeks after the trial had started, the prosecution rested their case. Surprisingly, the defense did as well. They were simply relying on their argument that the prosecution did not prove the guilt of the co-defendants, which is a ballsy move. Yeah. With this, though, the three girls decided they wanted to testify. It seemed as though their plan was to take full responsibility for the murders and prove Manson was not involved. Manson at this time did not want to testify. However, the following day, he surprised everyone. He did want to testify, and he wanted to do it before all of the others. The judge allowed it, 
although it would not be in the presence of the jury. Not surprisingly, Manson talked for hours. He spoke of his incarceration growing up, the ranch, the evidence, Bugliosi, Helter Skelter, music, the witnesses, and much, much more. When he was done, he told the other defendants, you don't have to testify now. So they didn't. After this, the attorneys were given 10 days in order to prepare their jury instructions and arguments. Ronald Hughes was looking forward to this as he was convinced he could win Leslie an acquittal. Unfortunately, he wouldn't be able to do that because he never showed up when court resumed on November 30th. He had apparently gone camping over the weekend and no one had heard from him the day prior. And no one would ever hear from him again. By December 12th, the search for Hughes was suspended and many were convinced that he was dead. When the trial began, it took the defendants no time to create further disturbances. Manson threw paper clips at the judge, the girls blamed him for doing away with Hughes, and Sadie knocked over an exhibit board and hit Bugliosi on the head. Witnesses said it appeared she was lunging for the buck knife on a nearby table. After this, the knife was kept well out of reach, which is a really good plan. Yeah, this shouldn't be out in the open. Nope, <laughs> not around the family. They love their buck knives. Another time, shortly after this, when Sadie was being escorted out of the court, she kicked a female deputy in the leg, grabbed Bugliosi's notes, and ripped them in half. Vincent let slip, you little bitch, under his breath. And of course, the media took this and ran with it. They even said that he had taken a swing at Susan Atkins, which is obviously not true. <laughs> but honestly, gotta love the media. I probably would have. <laughs> like, what the hell? Oh, yeah. What a bastard. <laughs> She's such a brat. Like, seriously, biggest brat. Now, nearing the end of the guilt trial, the attorneys made their closing arguments. Kenrix went on for seven grueling days. How can a person even talk for that long? I truly do not know, but I'm sure it was excruciating. Yeah. I'm sure the jury was like glazed over. Yeah. Like they wouldn't have absorbed any of that information, truly. No. It would have been me in my after lunch college class, just like snoozing away. <laughs> right. Just <laughs> not present. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> This did nothing to help the defense, of course. In fact, it probably hindered it. Finally, on January 15th, 1971, after seven months, the jury was able to start their deliberation and come to a verdict. Ten days later, they had a decision. Charles Manson, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Susan Atkins had all been found guilty of one count of conspiracy to commit murder and seven counts of murder in the first degree. For Leslie Van Houten, she was found guilty of one count of conspiracy to murder and two counts of murder in the first degree. It had taken 38 minutes to read out the 27 separate verdicts. Wow. That sounds exhausting. <laughs> yeah, man. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Just when you think the trial is over, guess again. There is still the penalty phase, so it can be decided whether or not the defendants will receive life imprisonment or the death penalty. Once again, more witnesses are brought in to testify. However, I won't be going into much of that since a lot of it is redundant from what we already know. There was one interesting witness, however, Bernard Lots of Papa Crow. I like great, that name. Great name. I think it, it really flows. Lots of Papa. Lots of Papa. <laughs> this was one of Manson's apparent murder victims, but clearly he didn't die. Manson had shot him in the stomach and he played dead, but was able to get medical attention in time and pulled through. Lots of Papa wasn't actually a Black Panther like Charlie had thought. He had just been a former dope dealer. Obviously, he was brought in to prove that Manson was capable of murder. Like, you can't find a better witness no. than that. <laughs> no, you sure can't. Others that took the stand included the parents to Patricia and Leslie, and this got a lot of sympathy from the jurors. Although they had been brought in so close to the beginning, by the end of it all, they had pretty much been forgotten about. Many of the Manson family members spoke as well, including Squeaky, Gypsy, Sadie, Patricia, Clem, and Leslie. They all shared bizarre ideas as to what had happened, and they also tried to set up a copycat theory, which I will discuss further in the next episode. Although they weren't all that convincing, they sure were confusing, and this basically led to the prosecution having to convince everyone once again that the defendants were indeed guilty and legally sane. What a nightmare. Seriously. I don't know how he did it. Like, 
seriously, <laughs> the patience that this trial would take. I, I don't have it. Yeah. No, I don't. <laughs> no. Fun to read about though. <laughs> yeah. I love true crime, but when it really gets into the nitty gritty, like I do enjoy aspects of law and everything, but like the details, like the shit you got to know, like it's too much. Yeah. When you're actually practicing law in a murder trial like this. No, thank you. No. The jurors were so relieved when the judge decided to end their sequestration on February 16th. This entire trial, eight long months, they had to be isolated from the rest of the world. Could you even imagine? Sort of. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> that is kind of the world that we're living in right now. <laughs> yeah. In, in a way. <laughs> but I mean, at least we can still zoom talk about crime right yes we can we can zoom each other we can look at you know the news even though honestly i don't because i don't want who to. wants to the only time i look at the news is for the morning news <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> on march 4th 1999 entered the courtroom with another bold look he trimmed his beard into a neat fork and shaved his head this was apparently to look like the devil this time however the three defendants didn't copy him Maybe they finally realized that when they did, it only helped prove his dominance. Testimony. I mean, I would have loved to see their, them uh, point their beards down. Right, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Take a little off the top and glue it onto their chin. And make it a little pointy. <laughs> That's a look. It's a vibe, Ben. It's a vibe. <laughs> it's a man's vibe, <laughs> for sure. Testimony for the penalty trial ended on March 16th. Bugliosi stated, quote, if this case were not a proper case for the imposition of the death penalty, no case ever would be, end quote. Paul Fitzgerald argued on Patricia's behalf that there had been 200,000 hours in her lifetime. Should she solely be judged for what occurred during three of those hours? Yes. Yes, absolutely. What the fuck kind of argument is that? That makes no sense. Like, if that logic was used in the justice system, there wouldn't be a justice system because you wouldn't be able to convict anyone of anything. Exactly. Because, <laughs> you know, a lot of crimes only take minutes or hours. So. Exactly. That is void. That makes no sense. Goodbye. On March 29th, after only 10 hours of deliberation, the jury had made their decision and the defendants were brought back in. This time, the girls had shaved their heads as well, so I guess they really didn't learn after all, but it was a little too late to make any influence on the jury anyways. Unfortunately, they did miss the opportunity of taking that hair that they shaved off and gluing it to their face, which is too bad. I mean, some of them could have had some really long beards. I mean, Katie, Big Patty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She, she, had some, she had some hair going on, so yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> The clerk then read out the verdicts. All four defendants would be receiving the death penalty. Most were happy about this. The family, of course, was not. The defendants were yelling, better lock your doors and watch your own kids. Sandy, Kathy, and some other girls out on the street had threatened to burn themselves to death with gasoline. But they obviously didn't go through with this. Instead, they shaved their heads as well. So, you know, hmm. that's... Pretty much the same thing. Has Absolutely. The same, effect. same effect. Right? Fire, baldness. Bald. You know. <laughs> like, damn, that lady's bald. Oh my God. Like, no. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Ugh, ridiculous. It's not surprising that this trial made history. Only four women have ever received the death penalty in California, and none of them were as young as the Manson girls, at least not up until this point. It had also been the longest and most expensive murder trial in American history. So that is pretty significant. Profound. The news of the Manson verdict was so huge that hardly anyone had noticed when a report came out that another body had been discovered. It was believed to be the missing defense attorney, Ronald Hughes. I will touch more on that in part four, but to end this episode, I will revisit the question asked at the top of the show, was Charles Manson truly responsible for the murders of 11 people, even if he wasn't present for them? Well, we can scratch lots of pop off that list, but I think after this trial, a few more could be tallied up on there, and some we haven't even mentioned yet. But in my personal opinion, 
I do think Charles Manson was responsible for these murders. I do too. I also believe that the other defendants were guilty. 100%. And they were acting in their right mind and they had a choice. Mm -hmm. But they wouldn't have come up with it if it wasn't for Charles. Exactly. They absolutely committed those murders 100%, but it was under the direction of Charles Manson. Like you said, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have happened without his command. Yeah. And some of them have histories that say they probably would have done some shady shit in their life. Right. Even if Charles wasn't around, but he was definitely a, a force. Absolutely. I feel like a lot of their crimes were like petty things like theft or arson, but like, mm -hmm. I know arson can obviously escalate, but like mm -hmm. to commit these vile, brutal murders, I don't think it would have escalated to that point. No. So in the next part, like I mentioned at the top of the show, it will be a little bit more lighthearted. <laughs> I know this was like a lot of information. <laughs> uh, first, we'll wrap up what happened with the other trials, such as with Tex Watson, and we'll cover some more suspicious deaths, attempted murders, and some good old conspiracy theories. So hope naturally you'll stick around for that because it's going to be super fun. Yeah. Uh, my Looking sources, forward to it. Yeah, me too. Uh, my sources, of course, were Helter Skelter by Vincent Bugliosi and Kurt Gentry, Member of the Family by Diane Lake, and good old Wikipedia. Any final thoughts before we move on? Um, just that so you did a great job oh. at summarizing the trial really well. And yeah, I'm excited to talk about all the other things. Well, I appreciate that because, oh my God, that was a lot of work. And I feel like I still omitted so much information so obviously if you want all of the information you have to read helter skelter like that's the only way yeah yeah and of course it's written from the prosecutor like he yes. knows all the things he did all the work he has all the court documents it's very detailed <laughs> it is very detailed like it's like every single step along the way it's incredible mm -hmm. honestly all right well i think i'm ready for some fluff and stuff what about you I'm so ready for some fluff and stuff. <laughs> I'm going to try to keep it short and sweet this week because that took a long time. Mm -hmm. Today's question is, what is the strangest nickname you have ever received? Okay, so my my nickname itself is Mickey, which is fine. Um, but I've, I've gotten lots of versions of that. So I've had like the Mixter, um, but probably my favorite is Mickles. Oh, like... <laughs> I really just, like that. <laughs> it's weird. The Mixter and Mickles are probably the strangest ones that have come out of that. <laughs> I really like that, honestly. That's really cute. <laughs> uh, fantastic. Um, I too have gotten lots of nicknames in the past. Most are relatively normal, like Tear Bear, like my my brother calls me, which is <laughs> sweet, I guess. <laughs> um, and then like Slam and yeah, Salmon. Yeah, adorable. Got Slam and Salmon since my, my maiden name is Salmon and, you know, Pterodactyl, all that kind of stuff. But um, I'd say, I don't know if it's the weirdest, but the most aggravating nickname I've ever got was Stara. And that was from high school when a boy was sitting behind me in class that I did not turn around to look at. And then just all of a sudden, one day he's like, hey, Stara, stop staring. And he acted as if I'd just been staring at him the entire time and I couldn't even see him from where I was sitting. So uh, for, teenage like, boys are the worst. <laughs> for a couple of years, he would just yell Stara at me and I hated it. Like there's a lot of worse nicknames out there, but I hated that nickname. <laughs> it's because he was being a dick. <laughs> it was so stupid. Anyways, <laughs> anyways, that's all I will say about that. My worst, strangest nickname was Stara. Love it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, make sure to answer our question as well. And obviously, please let us know what you think about the episode. You can email us at murdermerlot at gmail.com. Find us on Instagram at Murder Merlot Podcast, Facebook at Murder Merlot Podcast, and Twitter at Murder and Merlot One. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, and pretty much anywhere else you can find podcasts. We would love if you subscribed. And if you don't, you're dead to me. So, Michelle. Yeah. <laughs> Are you, are you going to spill the beans on our next book or are you still keeping it a secret? 
I, I'm, I'm going to tell the people. You're going to tell the people? That's exciting. Right. Let's do it. Yes. Okay. Um, our next book is Small Sacrifices by Anne Rule, and it's the Diane Downs story, which she's terrible. Yep. <laughs> like, full disclosure, this one involves children, and it's going to be rough, but she's an awful human being. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I don't know what was going but, on with but this one's always when she decided let's do BTK and then I'm doing that. Like, <laughs> like you just just really want to bring out the anger here, don't you? <laughs> Apparently. Yeah. And I don't know, small sacrifices has always been on my to read list. So I figured why not now? Right. Yeah. So exactly. And I'm excited to read another annual book. I think that's gonna be she's a goddess and yeah. We love her. So yeah. it's going to be super fun. Yeah. So if you've read Small Sacrifices or want to read Small Sacrifices, get started. Yeah. Join us, please. Yeah. That'd be great. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. All right, guys. Remember to drink wine because it's not good to keep things bottled up. Bye.